uh, the other is basically um, safety training. Yeah. If you are Hello, good morning, wakey wakey. It is six o'clock on the nose and you bang on time for Morning Prime. It is the last day of May 2023, 31st of May 2023. I trust that you slept easy, you've woken up well. It's another good day, numbingly cold, but uh, we hope that it will be warming up, of course, as the day ensues. Today is Global Today, where we take a critical analysis on matters foreign affairs, diplomacy, and security. Um, I have our, I am in the special company of the executive director of Amnesty International. This is Irungu Hilton. Also, we have with us this morning Dr. Hassan Kaneje, who is a director of the Horn Institute. We have Ahmed Hashi, a global uh, uh, governance and policy analyst. We're joined momentarily by Professor Peter Kagwanja, who is the CEO of Africa Policy Institute. And just to, of course, extend my hearty welcome to our panelists this morning. Hashi is munching his samosa <laughs> just to make sure that uh, he's revving up his engine today to uh, give us a critical analysis of uh, what is happening in and around us. And, of course, also following the current events in Ukraine and the Russian war as well. But let's hear from us, uh, the panelists. Uh, we begin with you, Irugu Hilton. You haven't seen you in a long time. I think in two weeks or three weeks mm. so far. Where have you been? What's new? So I, I've actually been in the country um, for most of that time. I, uh, uh, previous two weeks I was in Senegal where I realized that actually the culture of Mandamano um, is actually not a national sport. It's actually a Pan-African sport. That, uh, <laughs> there is a gentleman by the name of uh, Sonko, Sonko. Um, who trends from time to time and of course causes a bit of chaos in the Nairobi region. And there's no correlation um, with the Sonko But there's no correlation. Here. They're not even brothers. Uh, one is Senegalese, the other one is Kenyan. And, um, and the Sonko is a genuine name now. It's not a, a no, moniker no, it's, there. It's not a moniker. It's actually, a, uh, I think it's on his passport as well because he was arrested and prosecuted using that name. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think the other thing to note there really is that uh, we live in a, I think, in a restless period uh, where the uh, political parties, particularly the opposition parties, are still finding their feet in terms of how to navigate mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. difficult, um, I guess, the, the shrinking space that is there in many countries. Yes. And Senegal is like Kenya. Uh, they've got an opposition that's coming up for election. Uh, they, they've got an opposition. And that opposition is not clear whether the space is open and free for them to engage as well. Mm -hmm. So they have Mandamano every... I think it was, we, while I was there, there were two protests. I think one on Tuesday, one on Monday, and one on Friday. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, almost every week? Every week, yeah. Monday, Friday, it's Monday. I don't know if they've sustained every week um, since I've gone, but uh, definitely um, while I was there, there were some very intense uh, protests. Mm -hmm. Oh, fantastic. Dr. Hassan Kanenja, good to see you as well. Last yeah, week was a big day uh, on, uh, was it on Wednesday? Yes, yeah, that's you right. Can, you can yes. tell us more. Yeah, no, we... We missed you. Yeah, th thanks. I missed you guys too. Now we had a symposium on climate change, migration security mm -hmm. uh, in the light of what has been uh, happening, especially in the Horn of Africa. Yes. You know, it's not a theoretical concept for us in this region. I think it's a practical reality that we need uh, uh, to prepare for because in terms of the early warning mechanisms have considerably increased, but I just... We just don't understand why we don't prepare for some of these things when we are clear that they're going to happen, especially mm -hmm. the incident of droughts and famine mm -hmm. that uh, it has been facing our region today. Mm -hmm. uh, but while on that, uh, it looks like Lavrov was in town yes. uh, with some goodies. And maybe those of us from the North Rift are going to get tons of fertilizer. Uh, <laughs> to what extent, you know, that is going, of course, to be helpful, is subject to debate. But uh, I, I think uh, to the extent that we're going to get fertilizer, I think it's good. We can plan for the next season. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so Lavrov from here, he heads to South Africa, where I think there will be the meeting of foreign ministers from China as well. This is just uh, as an advanced team for the preparation of August uh, BRICS summit in South Africa. Yeah, and it's also a kind of a pushback because uh, Kuleba, the Ukrainian foreign minister, was you know in, in on the continent not too long ago, is trying to push the agenda. Uh, of course, backed mostly by Western countries. And I think Lavrov is also trying to undo uh, some of uh, that, but also try to push uh, in terms of establishing an alternative, mm -hmm. a centers of power, you know, to the existing uh, order. And uh, it's something that seems to be resonating. I think just yesterday, uh, South Africa removed, you know, offered immunity to all those who are going to attend 
the the BRICS summit in South Africa, which means, of course, uh, they are not going to arrest uh, Vladimir Putin. Not like it was going to happen anyway. Uh, but I think that formally uh, says, you know, South Africa is not going to play ball when it comes to arresting Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. But they are obligated because of the Rome statutes as it is. Now that will be a flagrant violation yeah, yeah. of the international law. There is what ought to be and there is what is in international relations. Uh, Omar Hassan al-Bashir was in this country and we were supposed to have arrested him a couple years ago. We never did. Uh, yeah. We never did and we never, we never will do you know, something like that. It's yes. just because of the realities of uh, international relations. So at the end of the day, it's all about your national interests. Uh, and I think also the history of us, uh, South Africa and Russia acts back, uh, uh, way yeah. too back. It's not just at the end of the day, even at the beginning of the day, it's about the national interest. Mm -hmm. Yes, so countries are going to make decisions based on that. But I think what also makes it complicated, especially with regard to Rome Statute, is the leading countries and democracies in the world, they are not part of the Rome Statute. And of course that, uh, even in cases that are really, really genuine, and uh, you know, like people sometimes need to be dealt with, it's going to be very hard to make a moral argument, especially when you're coming from Western capitals, when you're not part of uh, a framework. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which has, has been raising the question of uh, the efficacy of ICC, Rungu Hutton, especially mm -hmm. from the human rights uh, perspective, mm -hmm. that uh, you are not help all encompassing. We have so many nations that are not actually listed uh, or uh, are not uh, uh, ratified on the mm -hmm. Rome statutes. Uh, we have the uh, United States, we have Pakistan, we have, uh, I think, Indonesia as well, and uh, a list of other nations as well. So people are arguing, uh, what, where do they really gain their mandate if it's not a global sort of uh, mm -hmm. um, a prosecution body mm -hmm. that will actually go for anyone who is violating you know, human rights uh, okay. tenets that are the universal human rights law? Yeah, no, Dabal, I mean, I, I can understand the public cynicism um, with regard to the international justice system because, as we saw in the Amnesty International report um, a few months ago, there is too much double speak and mm -hmm. double standards uh, with regards to the um, accountability mechanisms for human rights. Um, but I think the argument that uh, because others do not um, observe the traffic law, um, uh, we also can climb on the curb and um, displace pedestrians is probably not a good enough argument for those of us um, that believe in human rights, believe in democracy. I think what we have to do is to hold that international standard um, ourselves mm -hmm. and demand that of others. But I think to say, um, uh, you know, because they're not doing it, we don't have to do it either, is actually a, a race to the bottom, not just for our countries, but even for the uh, continents and the, um, the world that we serve. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that would be my context. I think the trip by Laura, uh, Larov is interesting in the sense that there are a couple of things there. One is, um, you know, we know that Kenya has been extremely consistent with the exception of maybe one or two votes in the United Nations um, in terms of support for Ukraine. Uh, we're one of the few African countries that have declared that um, territorial sovereignty um, is important and um, also that, um, you know, that we will not accept, uh, you know, the invasion of one country by another, um, which I, th I think is really important. Um, and that's possibly why he has come to visit. I think uh, we do have an element of our foreign policy that's transactional, uh, particularly driven by financial challenges. Um, and, you know, these, um, I guess, 34 tons of fertilizer that are heading to um, Haninja's uh, hometown <laughs> um, and <laughs> elsewhere in the Republic um, will probably be, uh, you know, discussed in the context of increasing tea exports, which is what Kenya does quite a bit in terms of uh, Russia. But ultimately, what is happening is a realignment of the world in terms of what we could say is a new Cold War um, that has as the battleground Ukraine, but essentially is a division of uh, the world into those against and those for. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kenya is critical for that. And I think um, the colleagues at uh, Harambe House mm -hmm. need to be aware that Africa is not an infant. Um, we must not infantilize um, uh, Africa at a time like this because we are extremely powerful, um, not just in terms of our votes, but in terms of our bilateral and multilateral Pan-African policy. And uh, the Russians know this. This is why they're coming. Mm -hmm. um, there is an Africa-Russia summit coming up in July, which yes. uh, uh, <coughs> follows the uh, trip by uh, Vladimir Putin to South Africa. Mm -hmm. I'm still waiting to see whether the Premier of Hauteng, 
who mentioned at some point that if the national government does not take its international obligations seriously, mm -hmm. um, they may do. Um, so he may be arrested by provincial police uh, as he goes in. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I, you know, I get the point, Hassan, you're making about um, yes. you know that. Uh, there is real, real politics, and then there is, uh, you know, um, I guess international policy standards. But I think it is important to say that even when, um, you know, Bashir came to Nairobi, he did not come through JKIA. He had to yes. sneak in through Wilson Airport, and mm -hmm. uh, it was very humiliating, I think, for a head of state to be shuttled in, um, essentially walked to the dais by a cabinet secretary, and neither the foreign service. Um, nor the uh, you know other aspects of the government knew that he was coming because they had to keep it under wraps so that these terrible journalists that keep blowing up issues like this uh, would not know that he's coming. I spoke to an ambassador at the time, just to finish off, I spoke to an ambassador at the time, one of our Kenyan ambassadors, and uh, he was as shocked as I was mm. to see Hash, uh, Bashir walking to the dais at a time when we were promulgating our constitution. And of course, course, one of the constitutional articles was essentially that anything that we uh, accede to or that we ratify in the international space will automatically become law uh, within the Kenyan context. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, it is humiliating, I think, even for Putin to have to travel to South Africa in a context where he's not sure whether he's going to be arrested by a provincial officer um, or um, uh, shunned by the press. These are not good times. Uh, he might choose to stay away. Yeah, and, and we're given to understand also, uh, if we may open Hashi, that uh, Karim Khan is a wanted man in Russia, right? He's uh, just uh, here in uh, Congo right now, uh -huh. uh, trying to make uh, some of the investigations of uh, the war crimes that are, are going on in Congo as well. Mm. But, but let's yeah. listen in from uh, Ahmed Hashi. Uh, we had uh, the VP uh, from uh, Sudan also here in the country uh, trying to negotiate and have uh, some brokerage uh, uh, with, the, with the presence uh, all added to the gate of that occasion with President William Ruto. Well, <coughs> I think on the <coughs> International Criminal Court, I've had a position now for about 15 years. I think it's a racist um, institution. Um, apart from being a racist institution, it is part of the Illuminati of global governance, Deba. These are the elites that have produced these systems to try and police us here in this continent. Um, they're not going to police a guy called uh, Netanyahu who's been bombing Gaza in the morning, noon and night. You're not going to do that. Because uh, it's very powerful. Um, the uh, Americans, uh, you know that the Israel is a state in the Middle East, now the 56th state of the United States, mm. which has absolutely no cover for anything. It does anything it wants, when it wants, and how it wants. Mm. And here in Kenya, we are scared of them uh, a lot because you know, they provide our security forces and our intelligence. Um, they're deeply rooted in our state system itself. Um, so I think that... Uh, uh, the ICC is, a, is, is one of those places that uh, we shouldn't waste any of our time because uh, they, they don't have a police force, they don't have an army. The only thing they rely on is uh, the Security Council. The Security Council wants to throw nuclear weapons at uh, each other, so maybe they should go to the UN and arrest the US and Russian ambassadors there, take them to the ICC <laughs> for threatening uh, global peace. Uh, Tabal, you know. We can't uh, speak the English language with its niceties here in Africa. Uh, we have to speak it with its brutality. And the reason is because uh, they, our, our, our situation here is, is uh, just outstanding. Because, uh, you know, if we sign an anti-gay bill in this country, we'll get sanctions. I'm not kidding. If we sign an anti-gay bill, this is what's happening in Uganda. Yeah. We, uh, so I'm telling you that uh, we have to uh, wake up and smell the coffee, as they say in Boston. Uh, because if we don't um, start uh, bringing new economic ideas to our country, uh, the government doesn't seem to have any economic ideas. I saw Mr. Thuge being uh, vetted in parliament and he said, oh, it worked in Singapore. Uh, I did a case study, unfortunately, for Mr. Thuge in class a long time ago. And uh, they had no housing in Singapore. The small little island, 50 people. Uh, they had massive uh, injection of capital from uh, the U.S. The context and the economics are completely different. <coughs> um, <clears throat> you you have to get uh, <clears throat> there's something called voodoo economics. Um, it's not about supply and demand. Here in uh, our uneven economy, 
uh, we need an economic transformation. We don't need to tinker with, the, with our economy. We need to transform it. And um, you <coughs> can tell that the government of Ireland has absolutely lost its way. There's no gra grasp on its economic policy. Its political policy is, uh, is gone. And um, uh, nothing to say about the cultural point of view. Uh, its uh, cultural leader is the deputy president. Uh, <coughs> he's the intellectual of the government. And uh, we could see where that's going to take us. All right. Uh, we <laughs> shall hear from uh, Professor Peter Kagwanja much, much <laughs> later for now. Let's see what is fresh My off the press this morning. <laughs> and uh, we begin with the standard. This is what we are waking up to this morning. It's back to the streets, according to the standard today. No talks, it says. As Azmiyo leaders say, they will not resume bipartisan talks because government is pushing the finance bill that will worsen cost of living. Many demonstrations are the likely next step. This story continues on page four of the standard. And also, you have on the side but there, Azmiyo resolutions. Or resolutions, yeah, yeah, reject the finance bill in total. Mark Mwenje picked as a deputy minority whip of the National Assembly, replacing Sabina Shege. Finance bill as... Uh, presently crafted must be withdrawn and replaced by a bill that appreciates Kenyans' suffering. Kenya Kwanzaa must agree that all Jubilee MPs who have def defected have to resign and face by elections. Suspend bipartisan talks until conditions are met. Those are the resolutions from Azumio. And you can see, of course, a picture there of Azumio leader or leaders Peter Munya. George Wajakoya, Wycliffe Oparanya, Raila Odinga, and Mwangi Wairia yesterday during the parliamentary or the PG meeting. Also, KPLC blow as court holds 21 billion shillings tender. There is a past ghost return to haunt Ruto's power men. This is the probe that we had yesterday of uh, the DPP, who is now the spy master, being vetted, and also the CBK. A governor nominee as well being vetted yesterday seven tribes scoop new teacher service commission posts that is tucked to on page eight of the standard also there are 10 reasons why housing funds or fund is unconstitutional 10 reasons why housing fund is unconst unconstitutional and of course you can read all these analysis on page 14 and 15 by the constitutional lawyer keeping my guy there to get to know why the housing fund is unconstitutional. Teen charged with 19 Guyana murders. That is on the world page, world page on 34 inside the standard. And remember also you have the Enterprise Magazine that comes in handy for you today. Why Kenyan farms fail to cross borders. And will Marino uh, lift Europe Cup for sixth time? That is a probing question. That is tucked away on page 48 of the standard this morning. The Daily Nation big standoff over tax law is a splash today and we have the flag reading tassel opposition leader also demand that all rebel mps who defected be stripped off their seats and we can see there was a fresh standoff and uh, a, a fresh standoff looms today between Raila Odinga's Azmiu Laomoja and President William Ruto's Kenya Kwanzaa after a midnight ultimatum for the government to withdraw finance bill which they say is laden with punitive proposals lapsed last night that story continues on page four and you can see an insert here member uh, or members of public service sector unions participate in a procession outside parliament buildings in ruby on monday to protest against tax proposals in the finance bill on the sidebar i'll seek dollar bond to um, ease pressure on the shilling says Tuge, cbk cbk governor should say nominee tells mps he will encourage kenyans in the diaspora to invest in the bond as a way of increasing inflows into the country. That story continues on page 10. And Mazua Nyayo is back. Counties rush to revive Mazua Nyayo. Introduction of school milk programs by more than a dozen county governments has revived memories of the free Nyayo milk of the 1980s and 1990s. That story continues on page 8 of the Daily Nation. Parenting. Pullard Magazine is also inside the Delhi Nation today and burdened in retirement. A new survey has revealed that, that the burden senior citizens continue to carry in their sunset years 
at a time when they will be expected to rest after decades of toil as the country's dire unemployment rate leaves energetic youth and the children in some cases relying on their parents' meager pensions to survive. You can follow the story on page 7 of the Delhi Nation this morning. I have no apologies had you taken to task of the withdrawal of court cases. This is on page 10. And employ teachers to contract or employ teachers on contract to fix biting shortage. That is what the senators are suggesting. This story continues on page 12 of the Daily Nation. The star, Raila wants tax bill out, makes fresh demands. Sabina Shege kicked out. Mark Mwenje named deputy minority whip for Azmio. This continues on page 4 and 5 of the star this morning. And also there's a bill, the intersex bill, that wants schools to have gender neutral uniforms and toilets or toilets this is on page six of the star this morning this is a bill that has been drafted by kenya human rights uh, commission the intersex bill wants schools to have gender neutral uniforms and the toilets that is on page six of the star this morning and Hajj refuses to reveal net worth. Tuge worth 450 million shillings and also over 101,000 teachers required to address shortage, that is according to TSC, and City Hall to charge 3,000 shillings for yellow fever vaccine from July. People Daily up next, how Matatu tax will hurt Kenyans? Hidden in plain sight, advanced tax on passenger vehicles will raise cost of doing businesses for PSVs, taxis, and trucks. This will hurt workers too, as they will pay more if a finance bill is passed. As Mio pledges to fight against the proposals. We have this story continuing on page four and five of the People Daily this morning. Haji Thuge waited for NIS central bank jobs. That continues on page six and 14 of the People Daily this morning. All set for first Madaraka day, fit at under Ruto. And that is on page seven, big face off in tonight's Europa League finals. You, all that is stacked away on the back page of the People Daily. Taifa Leo, Traisum Safiri. That is a splash. Kiongozi wa nchi ya mifanya ziara 29 nje ya Kenya katika muda wa miezi nane peke akiwa madarakani. That is a splash today. Traisum Safiri. And uh, you have Raila Atoa Shanti Jipia kwa serikali. Ajitetea vikali mbele ya wabunge. And you have also an illustration of how the president has been globetrotting. And that is tucked away on page two of Taifa Leo this morning. Let's buckle down to some business. South Sudan is asking Ruto to end Joho's port monopoly. Autoport Limited has been hand handling bulk of Juba's imports. Kir says shift will ensure a smooth flow of goods. And uh, we have a story of Moses Kuria uh, pick for Keb's chair caught up in 278 million shillings unexplained well case. Some of the, of Dr. Kinyua's frozen property are listed here. ESCC says his net salary for the period was 11.6 million shillings. Land, three parcels of land in Rero at a, a figure of 95 million shillings. We have five parcels of land in Nairobi and Kajado, 68.8 million shillings. And also one parcel in Laikipia. Um, that costs 18 million shillings. Toyota Prado, undisclosed amount. Cash, well, 0.5 million shillings. And uh, cash in uh, UN denomination there, 0.3 million shillings. Uh, we can convert that in UN. And that is what the Business Daily has here. Read all about it inside the Business Daily. Thuge panel, or Thuge plans, local dollar bond to ease pressure on shilling. This DTB group profits jump 11% on large loan book and you can read all about Sun King getting 18 billion shillings to fund solar buyers all that in the business daily in Uganda and also this will pick the interest of our panelists this morning uh, spy chief is warning of new DR Congo war Uganda's spy master has placed intelligence and security agencies in districts bordering the Democratic Republic of Congo on high alert, warning that an outbreak of war 
um, likely to topple one or two governments is imminent. This is a story to want to follow on page four of the Daily Monitor this morning. And Ministry of Tourism's Tourism joined top 100 mid-sized company, uh, companies survey. Uh, you can read all about it also in the Daily Monitor. Why is the West mad at Uganda over anti-gay law? Why is the West mad at Uganda over anti-gay law? That is, that is on Newsbeat inside the Daily Monitor in Uganda. In Tanzania, diaspora special status plan to be finalized by December. That is what the citizen is writing about here. You can read all about it when you grab a copy. In Rwanda, Kayeshema's impending transfer from South Africa is explained. Kayeshema is accused of playing a pivotal role in the killings of close to 2,000 Tutsis in 1994. And this story is tucked on page four, page three of the New Times. ICT use in education is our priority. This is what uh, Minister Irere is saying. You can read all about it inside the New Times. Rainwater harvesting transforms lives, livelihoods in volcanic communities. All that tucked away inside the New Times. Let's see what the China Daily is saying. And uh, the first civilian astronaut, of course, will also be taking a tour in the space. Space crews meet in station. Six astronauts scheduled to stay together for about five days to complete joint task. And uh, that continues in the China Daily. Defense chief to attend key security dialogue. He says the attendance of the China's defense minister at Shangri Dialogue in Singapore will be vital to expand China's vision on global and regional stability. Uh, this is what experts are saying here. Also, there's a clash in Kosovo. He jumped to page two there. Let me just go back and show you where we are. The clash there in Kosovo. You can read about it inside the China Daily uh, this morning. The East African, Al Shabaab attack. Uganda seeks answer. We shall be discussing about this attack as well. Officials described as quote unquote sad and unfortunate news of deadly ambush in Somali base. And this story continues on page six of the East African this week. Irresistible rise of the Dar es Salaam port, Tanzania rips returns from 357 million shillings expansion project as facility efficiency improves. Also, Ruto Guru Rao chaos looms large fears of business logistics disruption as 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 a male leader threatens mass action the story continues on page five of the east african this week are we winning or losing that is a probing question that uh, we have the cartoonist asking here that is stano and the kenya of course will be celebrating its independence kenya at 60 we turn 60 this year are we losing or are we are winning? Let me hear from Peter Kagwanja. Good morning. Good to see you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, are we win, winning or losing? I think we are winning. Mm -hmm. uh, Kenya is still a work in progress. That we must accept. Uh, depending on who is counting, Kenya is older than me or younger than me. Uh, if we take Mandaraka, but we get December, then it is older. It's older than me. Now the the, the point here is that. Um, is work in progress. There are certain things that we need to do, or we, which, which we have not done. And there are quite a number of other things that we have done well. Uh, so I don't agree with complete uh, cynicism that uh, you know, Kenya is a failed project. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not true. Ken Kenya is uh, by far the, the, only, the only agrarian economy to reach the lower middle class. Mm -hmm. uh, not only on this continent, but globally, because we are not a mineral economy. Mm -hmm. uh, the other four, econ I mean, uh, four, four economies ahead of us are mineral economies. So we, we must take that into account. Uh, largely, we are not just agrarian, but we also we also become a major service economy. Uh, not only servicing our our population, but populations around us. Mm -hmm. uh, by this year, I think Kenya is the undisputed regional kingpin, uh, if you wish. Uh, power, yes. uh, backstopping peace in Congo, uh, South Sudan, Ethiopia, 
and uh, Sudan. So that, that's not, I mean, uh, and we can, we can uh, add, uh, you know, Somalia to that list because we've been at it since 2004. Uh, so so in, in a sense, we, we are playing our role. But uh, well, we, we are also in the decline. So if you are telling the 24% uh, the uh, Kenyans who have who uh, in 2019 were part of the middle class, driving, owning their houses, and uh, doing their thing, I mean, doing, I mean, taking their kids to good schools in their own uh, view, uh, and now have declined uh, from what we call middle class mm -hmm. to now poor people, uh, then we need to pull our, up our socks. Uh, in the last three years, many Kenyans have ceased to be middle class. Uh, the estimate is between 24% and 30%. And that's a huge number. Uh, people push down from you know, what they were earning to where they are. Uh, so it cannot be business as usual. Uh, so we, as we celebrate the 60th birthday, we must, we must uh, basically renew mm -hmm. our resolve to end poverty. I think we are having a lot of dances and, and you know, uh, cut walkings and all these uh, dramas and rhetoric. The reality is that we need to go back to the drawing board. Uh, the, two, the, two, the two governments uh, I mean, that, uh, that we've seen in the last uh, one decade or so, the Jubilee government and now the Kenya Kwanzaa government, seems to be literally not focused, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in a big way. We, we are more of a in advertising why are we why why is that the case uh, because if you look at the agenda that our founding fathers uh, put for us uh, war again is poverty disease and ignorance mm -hmm. if we stick to that in that regard then you would defeat poverty you have and all the other things and how do you defeat poverty increase the energy increase water increase i mean open up infrastructure those are means but now we are, up, we are amplifying means rather than the ends. The ends are very simple. Add the poverty of our people. Mm -hmm. Simple. Don't tell us how many kilometers of roads you have done, because that doesn't matter. Because you can do many kilometers and don't alleviate the poverty of our people. Uh, you know, how many kilo, I mean, okay, <coughs> kilowatts mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, our people consuming? That is the most important. Uh, you know, so adding poverty is important. Two, adding disease that uh, we, our, our, we, most of our families are basically devastated by lack of insurance, medical cover, and inability to pay their hospital bills. Mm -hmm. How many people now are prisoners of hospitals? Because you cannot get out because you've not paid your bill. Mm -hmm. uh, again, we are in 1963, and finally, uh, ignorance. Yes, we are. We are educating our people. We are one of the most educated uh, communities here. But are we targeting our education to what it means, to getting jobs so that we eliminate poverty? So until we tie those three things together and keep on talking about housing, talking about this, talking about that, uh, uh, really, 1960 is going to be a nightmare. Thank you. Right. Just a quick rejoinder. Um, uh, <coughs> I completely agree with my senior learned friend. I think. Uh, he has put it in a way that is uh, palatable, uh, and that is because uh, but uh, because Mimi Kijana, I can wrap, uh, I can take off the wrapping from uh, what Mr. Kogwa just just said. And uh, you know, the, there's no such thing as a as a good war, and there's no such thing as a bad peace. As Benjamin Franklin, um, we have a bad peace in Kenya, a really bad one. Um, and for the first time since independence, Debao, um, the, there is a malaise in this country like I've never felt before. Um, <clears throat> I think that, uh, you know, I'm from the generation that was born uh, after independence in the, uh, in the early 70s, late 60s. And um, Debao, you know, it is very, very clear to me that uh, the consecutive um, governments of Jubilee and um, Kenya Kwanzaa, uh, people forget that the current president was the deputy president of the, of the, of the last administration. Um, there is a, not a slippery slope, nor is there a decline, mm -hmm. but there is a headlong um, fall into something that we really don't know. Mm -hmm. And um, you could tell the fabric of our society 
by just driving around the city or going out into the countryside and you could see that uh, the uprightness of the people is not as upright as it used to be. You could see the destitute uh, moms and kids on the road. You could see the working poor uh, Deval don't have uh, access to credit. You could see um, single mothers, uh, which is an epidemic in this country and people don't like to talk about it. Single mothers with children is an epidemic in this country. The family system Deval is really shaking in its boots. And uh, something very critical that my senior learned has brought up is the middle class. The middle class is the engine of our society. It is nearly everything. If the middle class stands in this country, all of us, it's going to pull all of us. It's not the manufacturing people who are going to do it. It's not the traders who are going to do it. It's the middle class. They are the vanguard, if I can use a very old word, of our society. And about uh, something is happening to our country, and we ought to speak about it and speak about it plainly. As far as public policy is concerned, it's this house, this tax on... Uh, on the housing. And the ball, you could see the, how misguided this policy is. Right. And um, there is nothing wrong with a government making a mistake. Okay. A, a government is, is, gets more popular by admitting its mistake and saying, we have made a mistake on this area, and that area is what? The government has to listen to the people. That is the only communications they have. And then they have to have something called good government. What is good government about? The ability of the administration of this country to be uh, uh, done uh, in a way that allows a statecraft to deal with the political and economic issues that my senior learned has brought up. And if this crisis that we are in uh, is not punctured by leadership, uh, the ball by the end of the year, I believe that uh, the economy is going to explode. Okay. Uh, let's hear from Irugu Hilton. I wanted to touch on, I think, a uh, point that's been raised by Kagwanja. Good morning. I have to say that you are looking much better than Kenya. <laughs> <laughs> despite, despite your advanced stage. <laughs> so, uh, congratulations what, to the what, diet. What, and, are, uh, what are you telling them? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've uh, created some competition for, yeah, your, yeah. for your good wife. <laughs> <laughs> um, and by the way, to our viewers, um, Kagwanja is a happily married man. He yeah. um, uh, will not be uh, on the market. The market. Uh, any apps that we know of soon. Well, let me come back to this but issue. But why are you holding brief for him? He can say that he for himself. Say that by himself. <laughs> let, let him contradict no, me. He, ca he, ca he, ca he comes from Kahote in Moranga, which, oh, okay. which I, I is the exactly. neighboring, neighboring village to mine. So. <laughs> I, I know his home. I know his home. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, I think for me, the, um, let, me, let me debate a little bit one of the uh, proposals that the political class are generating, which is the debate around uh, succession. Um, and I think it's a really interesting debate, uh, particularly given that it's coming from Azimio, and of course the head of uh, uh, Azimio uh, alongside uh, Uhuru Kenyatta is, um, of course, uh, Raila Odinga. In 1961, Michael Blundell and um, Daniel Arap Moy made this case um, before the nation. And of course, it was not popular. We ended up with a unitary state, um, and um, we did not uh, allow for uh, territory within Kenya to secede. Um, it's now coming back uh, 60 years, uh, almost 60 years after it was uh, debated in 1961. Um, the concept of uh, succession in many ways has, you know, has affected very large, um, I guess, powerful nations uh, historically, even within this generation. I mean, you're talking about the USSR, you're talking about India in terms of Pakistan, you're talking about uh, the United States, where I believe uh, there is at least two or three states that debate uh, succession every year mm -hmm. um, and want to break away. But of course, we have the big example of Brexit, right? Um, now, the danger, I think, of this debate is essentially um, would be the equivalent of um, swallowing Panadol and then eating expired food and expecting to be fine after this uh, exercise. And I think mm -hmm. the, the point we have to keep reminding um, all of us really is that Kenya is powerful as you have described Kagwanja. It is, um, you know, it is uh, nationally coherent because we hold each part of our territory and each citizen and every population um, equal under one constitution and with a vision of a democratic um, uh, and human rights based uh, state. And I think this, this is really important. And um, of course, Azimio has generated this debate, but actually what is really interesting is it mirrors the debate of Kenya Kwanzaa, in particular, the deputy president's consistent re refrain to remind us that the Kenya Kwanzaa government has its shareholders. Mm -hmm. And there are others who are not shareholders, 
Um, so I think the, it's interesting to watch two sections of the political spectrum go off in different directions. Psychologists would tell us that actually what this is is a psychological, psychological withdrawal. And the symptoms are this. You have mood swings. You have intense stress, and st uh, rather sensitivity to stress issues. And the most important is that you tend to want to go into a corner and play by yourself. And I think what we have to remind both sections of the political class is that, you know, the, the Project Kenya is non-negotiable for some of us. I agree completely. Mm -hmm. Right, I, let, let's, just a moment. Let's hear from uh, Dr. Kanenja on the issue for right. cessation as well. Uh, and where he wants Kahoti yeah. to be. Mm -hmm. oh, no. <laughs> I was, I was, I was, was, we, we were speaking at Kenya 60, uh, and uh, we just w w was hoping to add something to that. Uh, you know, uh, I think still secession uh, is Kenya at 60. In the debate, yeah, yeah, yes. uh, yeah. <laughs> so we can put it under the, that yeah. ambit as well. Yeah, um, I think Kenya, in certain respect, has done well. You know, so far is the undisputed economic and thought leader in the region is uh, used as a bellwether state when it comes to democracy and openness on the continent, not just uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, and has been pretty influential on the international stage. It's only that uh, sometimes we, uh, we are at a 400 horsepower country that operates at 100 horsepower, and we have yet to realize our full potential. Now, sentiments about secession uh, you know, that are informed by what I call apathy, you know. Uh, there was a lot of hope, you know, in the Project Kenya, and I do agree with Irungo. To some of us, that is not negotiable, you know. It uh, must stand. But I think progressively, when we fail to deliver to our citizens, there is a sense that they don't belong. They start asking and questioning uh, what is the viability, what's the relevance of me being part of the whole when the whole does not care about the part that is me? And if we're not honest with ourselves and as leaders uh, in this country, I think, uh, you know, it is sometimes not so far off uh, to find that we may provoke citizens into taking actions that probably were unimaginable. Uh, who thought that January 6th in the United States would happen? But it did. And not just that, for those people who are familiar, you know, you have lots of militias, you know, guarding the local state houses and stuff like that, you know, in, and openly. And, and that's a recipe for disaster. Now, ours has not been lack of desire uh, to move in the direction that we want to. Neither has it been lack of dreams. And Kenya, I think Kenya are known for dreaming very big. What has been lacking for us in creating a project Kenya? that eliminates secessionist tendencies is lack of discipline. Mm -hmm. Lack of discipline. And I don't like sometimes when we keep talking about Singapore, Singapore, Singapore. That's a wrong example for us to use. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, number one, uh, Singapore is 700 square kilometers, kilometers, exactly the size of Nairobi. Mm. Exactly the size of Nairobi. That is a very small place. Kenya is 584,000 square kilometers. You mm. can't even compare. Literally, one town, one little village in Kenya, that is, that is all of Singapore. So those, those examples, you know, do not count. But fundamentally, Singapore had discipline. In 1986 BBC, BBS series, uh, Mazrui talked about appetites that uh, and was trying to castigate actually Africans. And we borrowed our Western appetites for good things without borrowing the Western discipline to produce those good things, mm -hmm. to make it work. And fundamentally, that has been lacking. And every after, you know, as a democracy, five years, Kenyans go to the market. They've been complaining about how poorly their donkey has been performing on the rice schools, and they still buy the donkey, and somehow they expect it's going to be a horse for the next five years. All the way from the local level, you know, uh, the, the, the county levels and stuff like that. And so the kind of leaders we're also electing, they're not the kind of leaders, frankly, if we have to be honest with ourselves from our MCS, and that's where they're messing up counties, you know, that are going to take us that vision. And so there's also a responsibility on our part, even as we complain and we go to the streets and stuff like that, who exactly are we actually electing? 
And once we elect those leaders, let's say today you, you're, you're a governor, what type of team are you putting together? Is it the type of team going to deliver to the citizens? A lot of times you're going to find, like counties nowadays, they're bloated with staff who are on payroll, they're not even delivering anything. Right. And then we wonder why we don't get services. Right. We have to have some introspection, look at ourselves, where do we actually need to go? So that the blame is not just on the government of the day, but what is our role in that mess? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ashi, uh, it's Peter. Yes. It's Peter. Yeah. I, I think at 60, we need to focus on three things that I think are really missing and that are messing us as we speak. One, of course, are, are our values in terms of pro building Project Kenya, which uh, you don't go right to say is, in, is non-negotiable. Now, uh, let, let's, let's, go, let's agree that uh, uh, Singapore, a particular its founding leader, Lee Kuan Yew, have something to offer to Kenya, a uh, village or location as it is, in terms of values, mm -hmm. not in terms of the specifics of other things. And Lee Kuan Yew identified the irrefutable ingredients of success in development. And it doesn't matter whether you go to the moon or whether you are here or you go to the mass. If you don't have those values, you cannot develop. Mm -hmm. One is meritocracy. Mm -hmm. In this country, it doesn't matter whether you went to school or you were, what you are trained in. Anybody it, it can appear in the newspapers. There's mm -hmm. holding certain, I mean, the, 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 the primary school teacher in Kenjuruini Primary School, where I went, mm -hmm. is now the head of the nuclear science in, uh, in the Republic of Kenya. And Kenyans will not have sleepless nights. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it, it doesn't matter anymore, meritocracy. Two, pragmatism. We are becoming doctrinaires. Whether it's our economists, whether it's our, we, we, we are basically st sticking to certain narrow thinking mm -hmm. about whether I'm a Christian, a Muslim, mm -hmm. or a whatever. We're not pragmatists. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what made, uh, you know, Singapore what it is in terms of values. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And finally, integrity never, uh, never matters in this country anymore. Uh, it is the ends that are more important than the means. Mm -hmm. And that's why the family doesn't matter anymore. Why, why, should, why should the family matter? It's a burden. Ask a, a, a young man who is not married in Muranga why he's not married. He's doing mathematics. But uh, keeping a wife is uh, more expensive than taking some few errors mm -hmm. into the local market and getting the, the girl who is hanging around there. You know? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, we have come to that idea that uh, married is, marriage is not important mm -hmm. as basically having... Uh, you know, a prostitute in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, uh, forgive the language. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, it, it, because we have not put integrity ahead. So that is the first point. Meritocracy, pragmatism, and integrity. On the contrary, meritocracy doesn't matter. Anybody can hold any position anywhere in this republic. Mm -hmm. Two, uh, we, we, we stick to our narrow thinking, whether they are ethnic, clan, or otherwise. And three, integrity doesn't matter. Never mind, we are the most Christian nation mm -hmm. on this continent. We are the most, uh, that's one. Mm -hmm. The second one is ideological mix. We started at, uh, you know, we had titanic battles, or let's say our founding fathers and mothers had titanic battles mm -hmm. about who we are. And we defined ourselves ideologically. We rejected Nkrumah, we rejected Nyerere, we rejected all those who are Sekotule and others who are talking about socialism. Mm -hmm. And we even, uh, you know, rejected the, the advice of our own, uh, Jaramogi Odinga, uh, Bildad Kagea, mm -hmm. and committed ourselves to a market economy. Where a market economy means we produce individually and sell as we are. And therefore, the national policies have to follow that. That was the gist of session of paper number 10 mm -hmm. of 1965. Mm -hmm. And subsequent papers and doc uh, documents reflected that ideological coherence. What are we doing now? Mm -hmm. We are mixing socialism and capitalism. Uh, the housing uh, debate we are having is as stupid ideologically as you can ever get. <laughs> Why do I say so? Because we are not socialists. <laughs> Why do you want to build a house for me? We are not a welfare state. We are not, no. We, There's so, nothing wrong the, with a welfare, welfare state. welfare state is okay. Yeah. Go to, go to James Mwangi in the equity and tell him to lower the, the mortgage yes. for Kenyans so that they can buy houses. 
that's welfareism. You, you, mm. And you can subsidize him mm -hmm. so that the Kenyans can access cheap houses. Mm. But don't describe the meters or the, the square meters of my house. Mm. Don't describe, uh, you know, how, whether I'm going to go upstairs or <laughs> downstairs. Mm. I marry so that I build a house for my wife. Mm. And my wife marries me because they want somebody who can build a house for them. Now, when you focus on houses for the middle class in urban areas, for example, what happened to the rural people? Mm -hmm. the, how, what is our rural housing like? Mm -hmm. So can we have a holistic housing policy that addresses the poor in the villages and the rich in Modaiga? Because that's, that's uh, very a, co a, co a coherent. <laughs> but why are we there? Why, why have we boxed ourselves to this corner? Because we have not been true to our ideological foundations, the ones that were left to us by our founding fathers. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to conclude by saying that I look around this country, and forgive me because I'm, I'm one of the few historians uh, from, the, from Mount, Mount Kenya. I, I may be the other one. I, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sorry. You, you left us a long time ago. <laughs> University of London, University of Dar es Salaam. That, we, we can debate. Uh, that, I'm not a professor. That is, that, that's your history. Your present is different. Finish. <laughs> now, so I look around and I cannot see <coughs> a Kenyan. In terms of, in terms of uh, the, the personality, Kwame Nkrumah, and uh, I mean, uh, of Boigny mm -hmm. and uh, Seda Sego were talking about the African personality. Mm. Who is a Kenyan except eating ugali in a nyamachoma? <laughs> Who are we in terms of our character? Why, do we, why have we found ourselves there? Because we have no political education about who a Kenya is. That's why a Kenyan wants to leave. Secessionism is all mm. about not, mm. being, not being able to identify yourself with an entity. Mm. So we're going to get a lot of these problems mm -hmm. about people succeeding. Why we don't put, give a premium to political education? Why is that? Because our politi political parties have the shortest, I mean, mortality rate. If I mean, Jubilee was born in 2013, and in 2023, we are now taking it to Rangata. Wow. That's where it is headed. Now, PNU, the same. Before it, we had NAC, which lasted for four years and died. So our political parties are simply, you know, special purpose vehicle, yeah. uh, vehicles. And political parties, if you look at Tanzania, if you look at China, if you look at America, if you look at Britain, are the vehicles of political education. They are the ones that produces a citizen. Wow. A, a citizen is produced by political parties. Yeah. So in this country, therefore, we, have liter we are literally losing the soul of Kenya. Mm -hmm. And if we lose the soul of Kenya, then we cannot have Kenya. So right. at 60, we risk losing our soul as a nation. I want to address Langata three things quickly. Yes, and Langata is full. full. And I just <laughs> want to address, I, I couldn't agree with my senior lady more, uh, and my colleague uh, Sakangaja and Mr. Irungu here on my right. Oscar, Oscar Wilde, probably one of the great novelists of the modern period, said that we often forgive uh, our criminals, but we never forgive our dreamers. <laughs> uh, my, my senior learner is talking about uh, <coughs> how we have never, never forgiven a group of people who dreamt up this uh, um, idea that uh, uh, it's possible for us, uh, after years of exploitation by uh, the international system, to stand up, form our nation states and form our regions, form our continent, and move on in the modern world. Debal, there is no such thing as Asian values. The idea that um, the Asian um, miracle, the idea that the Asian miracle in which a group of countries, about 10 of them, emerged in the Pacific Rim to be important economic and political global players in the world, um, and at the same time started worse off than Kenya. Every country in the Pacific Rim started off worse than Kenya. Uh, the Malaysian government came to Kenya, to the, to the University of Nairobi here, the ITB, the International Development School, to take the blueprint of Kenya's development and go and use it in Malaysia. It's a fact. In fact, they had a meeting with Tom Boyer at his office here. 
I have a, you know, like to read uh, minutes of meetings of countries. If you do that research, you kind of find out what the hell is going on in the world. And um, in Singapore and in um, all the Pacific Rim countries, in the Koreas, you name it, the countries are now um, part of the world's development uh, model. But how did they get there? Well, one of the things that we ought to be very clear about is uh, if you have um, an economic vision of transformation and you have a committed political class and you have zero tolerance for failure and corruption and you align yourself with economic powers in this world, um, you are likely to develop your economy and your country and move it to the next stage. Um, the, the Pacific Rim uh, was a geographical map of how the United States helped all those countries mm -hmm. produce certain uh, imports that could be sold in the United States in exchange for the US dollar and then development in those countries. This was an example of um, how to develop. So North Korea, for an example, is a totalitarian, totalitarian state that's living in poverty. It has one or two nuclear weapons. But if you look at South Korea, it's, a, it's a, one of the most top 10 developed countries in the world. Why? It's not because they could, they're, they're both Koreans. So there's no such thing as Asian values. Because if there was Asian values, North Korea would be the same as South Korea. They are one people. So what is it? It's the direct intervention of the Western world and its economic levers and a certain pro, uh, prescription for the South Korean government to follow. There was one time in South Korea where um, there's something called chairbowls. Chair These are corporate groups, massive corporate groups. The chairman or the CEO of that um, corporation, if it failed, would be shot by the military government for failing to deliver to the country. Uh, what did we do here, Dewa? We decided to steal farms and have fat cows uh, and then use coffee and tea as our economic model. Today, as we stand, Dewa, our problem, as our, my senior leader has said, is the inability of our people to have clear courage to think. You don't need an intellect to, to, to think clearly, but you need courage. And if we don't have that courage to think about how we're going to take this country forward, then the bar, we're going to be in this vicious cycle of poverty, ignorance, and disease. I'll give you an example, Nepal. Mr. Thuge says he wants to bring a bond into the market so that it can attract the money that's in the accounts, which is about <coughs> a trillion shillings. Nepal, if you had said that we need to build a connection to something called the Inga Dam and float that bond in 10 countries in East Africa and you agreed to float, float, I would put money in it. I would put my little savings into it. Because I know that electricity and power are the basis for development. And it is that, that ability to get power, cheap power, for us to get into manufacturing. And for us to get into manufacturing, Debal, then we would need housing. That is where the housing comes in. Thank that you. is when we start building houses for people from Kejabi in other rivers. So they can go to these factories Thank and you. earn a decent pay. So the, the problem is thinking. There is no thinking. And if there is thinking, we can move forward. All right, so we are due for a station break right now. It's 7 o'clock on the nose. When we circle back, of course, we shall look at that particular surprise visit from uh, the Russian foreign minister. That is uh, Sergei Lavrov, who was here on Monday. And also take a keen analysis on uh, the latest development in Uganda with the anti-gay uh, bill, which is now has been, which is now an act that has been assented to by the president. And what does it portend also as a silent learning point for us here in the country, because there is a bill also in on the floor of the house. And now there is also another bill that uh, the Kenya Human Rights Commission is coming up with, the intersex bill, where we will not be having a male or a female toilet. But we want a unisex toilet, also the uniforms for our children as well. Are we on the onset of a culture war that is being advanced by the West? We'll take a short break. We'll circle back with more.